All right, well, we are going to jump into the Word today, and um, I've also been in and out the last few weeks with my son's uh, sports schedule and vacation, and then last week um, having Pastor Julian, this last Sunday having, thank you, sir, um, having uh, Worship and Prayer Sunday, but I am very, very, very excited that we're going to jump into this series today, um, either in this room or all the, all the overflow rooms, there's a mom's room, cafe, wherever you're watching, but we're going to spend the next four Sundays on the book of Colossians. We're going to take the book of Colossians over the next four Sundays, and we're going to go line by line, verse by verse, thought by thought, through the next four weeks through the book of Colossians. And as I've said this before, um, I walk on this stage uh, each Sunday, maybe with a different hat, if you will. Some Sundays um, to preach and to build faith and to cast vision. Some Sundays as a father and pastor and shepherd to lead our church through a conversation. Some Sundays... um, uh, many different things, but today on, I step on this stage as a teacher, um, which is my favorite. I could sit on a stool and teach all day long. It's my favorite thing to do. And so over the next four weeks, we're going to, line by line, go through the book of Colossians. And we made it real easy for you. We got a book here for you. Um, and I know some of you are like, oh, I take notes in my mind. Write it down. Um, my dad used to always say that a short pencil is better than a long memory. And so um, it makes sense. Um, Because there's things I'm sure with you, like, I'll remember that, and then you don't. Like, what did he say? What happened? And so uh, over the next four weeks, I would challenge you to bring this every single Sunday. Uh, And you can read it right there. You can, if you don't have a Bible, it's right there. You can follow along and read with me. And then the next page is notes. And then chapter two, page notes. So uh, you can just bring this back every Sunday for the next four weeks. And uh, we do this uh, at least hopefully twice a year, sometimes once a year, depending upon series. Uh, But we do book studies. We've done Jonah. We've done Philippians. We've done... Um, Ephesians, we've done Psalms, we've done Proverbs, we've done Song of Solomon, we've done Job, we've done Jonah, and now we're going to do Colossians. And so if you attend church regularly over the next five, ten years, you have a pretty good stack of these because we do these every time we do a book study. So if you keep these and write down um, and take notes, you'll have a pretty good stack over the next five, ten years of full-on book studies that we're going to go through together. And you can go back and pray and read and um, obviously take notes right now. And then also uh, over this next week, over the next couple days, go back to Colossians 1 and pray again and reread and write and take notes. So you can grab that. That is there for you. Um, But we're going to jump into Colossians today. Colossians chapter 1. We're going to try to get through the entire chapter today. Last service, it was was real close. We barely got there, but we did finish the entire chapter, chapter 1. A few things about Colossians to make sure that you're on the same page. Some nerdy stuff, some um, uh, historical stuff that you need to know. Number one, this book is called Colossians simply because there is a city named Colossae. Most of Paul's letters, when he would write to people, he would write to Galatia, which there is a city named Galatia, so he writes the book of Galatians. He writes first and second Thessalonians. Why? Because there's a city named Thessalonica. And so this book is called Colossians simply because there's a city named Colossae. What's interesting about Colossae is it's, um, it's a tri-city. There is, make sure you pay attention here, there's three cities right next to each other named Colossae, Laodicea, and Hierapolis. Okay, pay attention to those names. Laodicea, Colossae, and Hierapolis. It's a little little triangle town, little tri-town there, and it's about 100 miles from Ephesus, if you will. Ephesus would be like Portland. Ephesus is the major city near that Mediterranean part of the sea, and then about 100 miles down is Colossae, Hierapolis, and Laodicea, so back Eugene. Like if Portland is Ephesus, Eugene is Colossae. And what's going on here, which is very, very interesting about this book, is usually in all of other Paul's books when he would write, he would write to a church that he planted, that he started. That's why the language in Galatians and Thessalonians and these books, he said, I can't wait to see you again. I miss you. Because what Paul would do is he would travel somewhere for two years plant a church there, raise it up, give it to someone, leave, and then write them a letter. This book is the only book in the entire New Testament that Paul writes of a church he did not start. Paul has never been to Colossae. He did not start this church. He did not plant it. He did not meet these people. What is happening, and you read this in Acts and other historical church literature, is that there is a man named Epaphus, and we'll read about him in about a couple uh, uh, verses from now. But this man was in Ephesus at one of Paul's gatherings. He's from Colossae. He was traveling to Ephesus. He gets saved at one of Paul's teachings. 
He then goes home back to Colossae where there is no Christians. He says, hey, now that I've met Jesus, I'm going to go start, I'm going to go back home and start a church. He starts a church in his home and then another home and another home. And this church is growing, but there's a bunch of issues within the church theologically. And he's like, I don't know how to answer these questions. I need to go ask Paul. Paul right now is currently in prison in Ephesus. So he's writing this letter from a prison cell. And Epaphras comes back to Paul and says, hey, I went home to Colossae. I started this church and we're having these issues. I need your help. Can you please write this church a letter and answer these questions? And Paul says, I got you. And now we have the book of Colossians. So Paul writes this letter in jail, gives it to the pastor, and the pastor takes it home to Colossae and reads this letter out loud. And now this is why and how we have the book of Colossians. Okay? We good to go? We know what's going on? Great class. Here we go. Colossians chapter 1 and verse 3. Well, verses 1 and 2 is just the intro. My name is Paul to all the Christians in Colossae, which I just went over. So we'll start in verse 3. And we're going to read this in sections. So we're going to go through four sections today in bite-sized pieces through chapter 1. Here we go. We always pray for you. We give thanks to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, for, here are some of these repeating phrases, for we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and your love for all of God's people, which come from your confident hope of what God has reserved for you in heaven. You've had this expectation ever since you first heard the truth of the good news. This same good news that came to you is now going all over the world. It is bearing fruit everywhere, changing lives, just as it has changed your lives from the day you first heard and understood the truth about God's wonderful grace. You learned about this good news from Epaphus right there, our beloved co-worker. He's, he is Christ's faithful servant, and he's now helping us on your behalf. He has told us about your love for others that the Holy Spirit has given you. So we have not stopped praying for you since we first heard about you. We ask God to give you complete knowledge, hear these phrases here, complete knowledge of his will and to give you spiritual wisdom and understanding. Then the way you live will always honor and please the Lord and your lives will produce every kind of good fruit. All the while you will grow as you learn to know God better and better. We're almost done. Stay with me. We also pray that you will be strengthened with all his glorious power so you will have endurance and patience that you need. May you be filled with joy, always thanking the Father, for he has enabled you to share in the inheritance that belongs to his people who live in the light. Last sentence here. For, we have, for he has rescued us from the kingdom of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his dear son who has purchased our freedom and forgave our sins. Stop there. Verses 3 to 14. Section 1. What Paul is saying is this. We'll, we'll take this in bite sizes. The first section, verses 3 to 14, 13, Paul's saying this, Jesus cannot be hidden. Jesus cannot be hidden. What Paul, did you notice the repeating language? For I've heard these things about you. I've heard about your love. I've heard about your growth. I've seen your fruit. And all these people have told me about your love for people, your love for God, and your lives are being changed, and you're growing in knowledge, you're growing in understanding. If you notice from uh, verses 3 to verses 14, it's all this repeating language. Of I've heard, I've seen, I've been told, we've noticed your fruit, your life, your change. Why? Because what is Paul saying? I'm thanking, verse, uh, those nine verses, I'm thanking Jesus that the gospel is evident in your life. I'm thanking Jesus that this gospel that you have received is being evident and shown in your life. What is Paul saying, the first nine verses? Jesus cannot be hidden. When you begin to follow Jesus, there should be evidence therein. It's one thing to claim church. It's one thing to claim Jesus. But if you are claiming something that there is no evidence of, Paul would be saying, I don't see the evidence, so you shouldn't claim that thing. I see it. I hear about it. I've heard about it. It's evident. Your fruit, your life, your change, your knowledge. Jesus cannot be hidden in your life. Now, in our day and age, especially in Portland, I don't care if you live in Cambridge, wherever you live, we live in this city called Portland, this very, very anti-Jesus, anti-church, far progressive, anti-God's moral, God's book, any of it city. And the funny part is when, when, when people in Portland become Christian, it sounds a bit like this. Well, yeah, I'm a Christian, 
but it's personal. And I don't need to show anyone. I don't need to tell anyone. I don't care about people's opinions. I don't need to write sticky notes to people and tell them God loves them and go outside at the march or have a verse on my bio or have the little fish on my car. I don't need to tell people. No, you don't understand. My relationship is private. My relationship is personal. It's just between me and Jesus. The only friend, the only problem with that notion is that's nowhere in the Bible. That's it. That's the only problem is the entire New Testament says the opposite. For you will know a tree by their fruit. Yeah. And so Paul for nine verses is thanking people. I'm so thankful that the gospel is evident in your life. Yeah. Friend, you can write this down. A bunch of phrases you can write down today. Yes, your relationship with Jesus is personal, but that does not mean it's private. Yeah. I can't accept Jesus for you. Your grandma can't accept Jesus for you. Your boyfriend can't accept Jesus for you. Your spouse can't accept Jesus for you. Oh, yes, absolutely, it is personal between you and Jesus. But that does not mean it's private. Yeah. Side note, this might get me canceled, but so be it. <laughs> Side note, every single person in this room, if you are talking to somebody that only wants your relationship to remain private, Run for the hills, because you are probably one of seven others he's talking to, or she's talking to, because you never hide something you love. So if anyone you are talking to right now is like, no, 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 we don't need to go public, it's none of their business. No, it doesn't matter, we don't need to post pictures, we don't need to have it in our bio, this doesn't matter, it's between, it's just us. We'll just keep it private. That person is manipulating you because you never hide what you love. And by the way, we don't do this in any other section of our life. Food, restaurants, movies. We post everything that we love. Except Jesus. Except Jesus. He's the one heir of our life. Like, no, 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 that's just me. But this is what I ate today. This is my favorite restaurant. These are my new shoes. This is my new house. This is my new... Why? Because we are prone to talk about things we love. Yeah. That should be the same with Jesus. If you have fallen in love with Jesus and you have professed this gospel in your life, there should be evidence of it in your life. Amen. Not just internally, but externally. The first nine verses, Paul is just simply thanking these people, I'm so glad the gospel is evident. You can't hide Jesus. Now, notice what I said in the beginning during our little bit of uh, historical nerdy talk. That was very important. How did this book come about? A man who got saved went to Paul, got saved under one of his ministries and one of his teaching at some point, went home back to Colossae and started a church. The only reason we're reading this book is because a man took Jesus home. Wow. Notice how Epaphus did not stay in Ephesus. He didn't stay with Paul. He didn't stay wherever he got saved. His first idea was, now that I've accepted the gospel of Jesus, I need to go home. And I need to go start a church in my house. The only reason people were saved in Colossae, the only reason we have this book named Colossians is because a man took Jesus home. What could happen if the couple thousand people that go to our church took Jesus home? What families could be changed? What neighborhoods could be changed? What could we do in this city if we all just took Jesus home? But unfortunately, the American gospel, we have diluted following Jesus down to go to God's house. And I'm glad that you're here. Please keep coming to church. It's good for you. But Christianity is not just you going to God's house. It's Him coming to yours. It's Him coming to your dining table. It's Him coming to your in-laws. It's Him coming to your work and your school and your friends. What would happen if you actually took Jesus home? See, Jesus, you must understand this, that Jesus... When you begin to add him to your life, he will not remain hidden. He will be evident in all of your life. What's amazing is right near this town, 
right off the Mediterranean Sea, there's this, there's this river that matters. It's called the Jordan Sea. The, sorry, the Jordan River. The Jordan River is right next to the Mediterranean Sea. And up north, follow me, up north, the Jordan River feeds into the Sea of Galilee where Jesus does a lot of his miracles. Then the Jordan River feeds south into this other lake, this other area called the Dead Sea. These two areas are still here to this day. You can go swim in the Dead Sea. It's not good for you. And you can go swim in the Sea of Galilee. You know what's amazing is the same river feeds two different seas. But when you do your, your uh, study, the Dead Sea is called the Dead Sea for a reason. Because nothing can live in it. There's no fish. It's not good for you to swim in it. It's not good for you to swallow the water. It's not, it's, it's a, that's why they call it the Dead Sea. But the complete opposite is true of the Sea of Galilee. It's the most flourishing sea. Trees and animals and fish. Like it is a flourishing sea. How can the same river feed two different seas that have two completely different relationships with the same river? You know how? Because the Dead Sea has no outlets. It only sustains itself. The Sea of Galilee has multiple outlets that the river is flowing to and feeding other things. How can the Jordan River give life to the Sea of Galilee and death to the Dead Sea? Because if you think you can just hoard Jesus to yourself and be like the Dead Sea, everything flows in and nothing flows out. Nothing will live there. But if you would live like the Sea of Galilee and you have outlets and your hands are open and you're living with exposure with Jesus to your life, life will be there. Yes, yes. Jesus, the Jordan River, can feed two of the same people, but they have completely different relationships with him. Why? Because we're not called to hoard Jesus and hide Jesus and keep him to ourselves. You will become like the Dead Sea. We're called to be at the Sea of Galilee. Why? Because when you serve Jesus, it is evident. I want you to notice a few things. We'll go back through verse 9. I want you to read again. He says, so we have not stopped praying for you since we've heard about you. We ask God to give you, look at these uh, phrases. He says like the same thing like six different ways. We ask God to give you complete knowledge of his will, to give you spiritual wisdom and understanding. Then you will live like, your, your life will be honoring and pleasing to the Lord. Notice what he gets into here in these, in these couple of verses. He gets into knowledge, wisdom, spiritual wisdom, understanding, learning, growing. Two verses later, he says, make sure you grow in God, learn more about God. But this is what's amazing. You must know this. It'll be on the screen as well. The gospel is not just called to inform you, it's called to transform you. Notice what he's saying. I pray you grow in knowledge. I pray you grow in wisdom. I pray you grow in spiritual understanding. I pray you get to know God so that fruit's there. Notice the, the language that Paul is using. He's saying the point of knowledge is growth, not arrogance. Good. That's good. The point of learning and growing and understanding and knowledge is so that there might be fruit there. Did you know that in the Hebrew language, the same word for listen is the same word for obey. They're not two different words. They're one word, listen and obey. Because to God and in his language from the Old Testament Hebrew, if you don't obey, they assumed you didn't listen. Parents, you know this. When you tell a kid, clean your room, clean your room. And then they go, did you hear me? Are you not asking, do their ears work? What are you saying? You obviously did not hear me because you did not obey. A sign of obedience is that you listened. Yeah. 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 Many Christians in the world are claiming to listen. They are claiming to hear. They are claiming to know. But there is no obedience present at all. Wow. And so then Jesus would say back, you probably didn't hear me then. You probably did not understand me then. Well, how do you know that? Because you're not obeying what you heard. So this whole language of these three verses is make sure you understand. Make sure you know. Make sure you learn. Make sure you grow. Get spiritual wisdom. The whole point of wisdom is fruit. The whole point of learning is change. 
The whole point of growing and understanding is that you might grow and change in the knowledge of Jesus. He says, I, I, I'm thankful for this. And let's go to verse, let's go to verse 12. We're almost done with the first section. You okay? Yes. Verse 12, he says, I'm always thanking the Father for he's enabled you to share his inheritance that belongs to his people who live in the light. Verse 13, catch this please. Um, I, I'm not a big grammar person. I hate grammar. Sorry all of the English majors. Um, but grammar matters even in theology, by the way. Look at what he says in verse 13. For he has rescued us. Uh, class, is that past or present tense? Some of you are like, eh. <laughs> past tense. Rescued us from the kingdom of darkness and transferred past or present. Past tense. Some of you skipped some classes. <laughs> um, once you write this down, it will matter. The citizenship and rescue language are both past tense. Yeah. Yeah. They're not present tense. They're not continual. Ing. He's not rescuing. It's not future tense. He will rescue. They're both past tense. Rescued and transferred. Meaning... Write this down. Meaning, you, are, you aren't bearing fruit for this position. You are bearing fruit from this position. Yes. Yes. So let me break that down for you. You are not saying, man, I hope one day I can bear enough fruit that he might rescue me. I hope I change enough that he might love me. I hope I do enough that he might transfer me. It is all past tense. I have been transferred. I have been rescued. Yes. So the fruit I'm bearing and the life I'm bearing is from that position, not for it. This matters greatly because some of you are still trying to earn something you already have. Well, if I can just give a bit more and if I can serve a bit more, if I can stop smoking that or drinking that or sleep with her, if I can just be better, if I can just have 10 good days in a row. Wait, where are you living from? Are you living for something? Or are you living from something? Oh, I know this is elementary, but it is very, very important to your faith. Because every decision you make when it comes to God, why are you making it? The good, the fruit, the producing, the change, the life. Why? Are you doing it so that God might one day rescue you? No. All this life, all this fruit that we're living is from a position. We've already been rescued. You've already been transferred. If you've accepted the name of Jesus, you've been transferred. You've been rescued. I know I'm hammering on this because some of you are still trying to act like you need to earn something. And you, you're like, God, did you, you don't say this because we know better. God, did you see? <laughs> Tithe today. How do you feel about it, Lord? Lord, did you say I served two Sundays in a row? <laughs> Lord, I said I wouldn't do it again. It's been seven days. It's, it's funny, but we do this. Yeah. Yeah. Because we subconsciously and subtly think you're still trying to earn something you already possess. And it will change you if you understand the life I'm living is from being rescued. I'm not trying to earn to be rescued. It's all past tense. It's all past tense. The first section that we've unpacked simply is Jesus cannot be hidden. The gospel will be evident. And I know this is not very popular preaching, but I, I have to say it because of the Bible. If there's no evidence, you might want to question, have you received? If there's no evidence of the gospel in your life, you should ask yourself, have I actually received the gospel? Now, you're like, well, what's the evidence? Great question. He says there's six things. I'll, real easy slide for you. The evidence of Jesus, he gives a list in these first nine verses. Number one, the evidence is a life worthy in producing fruit. It's a life that is strengthened and empowered. It's a life that has endurance and patience. 
It's a life that has joy and thanksgiving. By the way, joy is not an elementary thing. It's the deep thing of heaven. Joy and thanksgiving is not a childish, like, oh, they just have joy. And by the way, joy is not happiness. That's different. But a sign of the fruit of Jesus is joy and thanksgiving. We should be the happiest people on earth. Because we have the joy of Jesus. Knowledge and understanding, the love for God and others. That's the evidence of the gospel in our life. But look at this little thing right here. Produced by the Holy Spirit, not knowledge. Look it, look it. I love these green pants, by the way. (laughs) Look at verse 8. He has told us about the love for others that the Holy Spirit produced. He does not say, I'm so thankful the evidence of God with how smart you are, with the knowledge and the evidence and the wisdom and the spiritual guidance. He says, no, this thing in you that we see was produced by the Holy Spirit. This list, by the way, you go back, that middle list, you can't produce. You can't. It is the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God that lives in you. So if you're sitting here right now going, man, there's no joy or thanksgiving in my life. Don't go. Come on. More joy. (laughs) Come on. We can do this. Don't get angry. Go deeper. If you look at your life and go, man, there there is no love for God or others. Don't go, come on, let's be, let's be more loving today. No, you don't produce this. Your efforts don't produce this. If you look on this list and one of those things are absent, talk to the author of them. So you go back to Holy Spirit saying, Holy Spirit, I need you to produce some joy in my life. Holy Spirit, I need you to open my mind to have knowledge and understanding. It is the production, it is the producing of the Spirit of God. It is not knowledge. First section. First nine verses, Jesus cannot be hidden. Let's keep going. We're going to read Colossians 15, 1, 15 to 20, and authors and scholars and historians and theologians would say uh, there are three prominent passages of Scripture in the New Testament above all. Three most important passages of Scripture in all the New Testament about Jesus. Ephesians 1, Colossians 1, 15 to 20, and Romans 8 are the three highest hierarchy, if you will, not that Scripture is better than others, but three most important passages Christians must understand. Ephesians 1, Colossians 1, 15 to 20, and Romans 8. So here we go. Verse 15. Just look at this list. It's a poem, by the way. It's a song. Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. He existed before anything was created and is supreme over all creation. For through him, God created everything in the heavenly realms and on earth. He made the things we can see and the things we can't see. We went over these sections during a spiritual realm series before I got shingles. (laughs) Worth it. (laughs) He made things we can see and things we can't see, such as thrones, kingdoms, rulers, authorities, and the unseen world. Everything was created through him and for him. He existed before anything else, and he holds all creation together. Christ is also the head of the church, which is his body. For he is the beginning supreme over all who rise from the dead. So he is the first in everything. For God in all his fullness was pleased to live in Christ, and through him God reconciled everything to himself. He made peace with everything in heaven and on earth by means of Christ's blood on the cross. Section 2, we'll stop there. So number one, the first section is Jesus cannot be hidden. Second section is Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. What's super interesting, um, I've said this before, and I think it's just worth noteworthy again, but uh, churches uh, rose at six and a half years old, roughly. I've been emailed a couple hundred times. Uh, Some super nice ones, some not nice ones, some short ones, some books. Um, and I've been asked 100,000 questions. And it usually start, the, the heading of the email usually starts like this. Pastor, what is your stance on homosexuality, abortion, the war of Russia and Ukraine, the border, politics, Trump, Biden, um, money, the church, whatever. Like a bazillion different questions I've been asked. Pastor, what is your stance on, and I'll see someone at Safeway in the checkout line, like, Pastor, now that, now that I have you. 
And it always starts like that. Pastor, now that I have you, I'm like, you don't have me. Um, real quick, what's your stance on? I'm like, I'm just trying to get eggs and bread, my guy. I'm just trying to go home um, and not answer questions about abortion and Safeway checkout line. But um, I've been asked so many different questions. You know what I've never been asked in the history of the church? Not one time. Pastor, what's your stance on Jesus? Never. I've never had someone like, hey, I'm, I'm praying and thinking about joining Rose. I just want to know, who do you think Jesus is? They don't care. You know why? Unfortunately, most modern Christians are more concerned about church's cultural stances than they are their theology ones. And most modern Christians will be okay with me preaching heresy about Jesus as long as we agree on their political stance on that issue. I can think Jesus is this or that. That's kind of true. Kind of like, I don't know if that's true, but at least we agree here. At least you hold my stance there. Why? Because I think for many of us in this room, and I know I'm shuffling feathers right now, you need to ask yourself, who is Jesus to you? Who is he? You have to answer it. Who is Jesus to you? Can you define who you think he is? And if you can't, you're like, well, I don't know. He is Jesus to me. Well, here's a great list simply on who Jesus is. Let's just go through who he is. Number one, we'll read it again. Jesus Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. Start there. Paul is saying, I just want to remind you, Jesus is not another man. He's not Muhammad. He's not Confucius. He's not Gandhi. He's not another good prophet. He's not another good moralist. He's not the Enlightenment era. You must understand that we believe Jesus is God in human flesh. Yes, we can never see God because he's invisible, but we've seen God because we've seen Jesus. And he is the visible image of the invisible God. First big claim. Number two, he existed before anything was created and is supreme over all creation. Number two, he's co-eternal. You must understand this, that when Mary gave birth to Jesus, that was not his birthday. He was not created that day. He was born into the world that day, but he is eternal, co-eternal with God. And by the way, he's Lord, or he uses a big word, we'll unpack in a moment, supreme over all creation. I know, it's a lot. Science is not supreme. I know, it's a lot. The telescope is not supreme. I know, it's a lot. Google Earth is not supreme. I know, it's a lot. Your aunt is not supreme. (laughs) I know, it's a lot. You're not supreme. Jesus is supreme over all creation. The world is not being held together by atoms. It's being held together by the word of God. The cosmos is not on the brink of of chaos because one atom is going to fall out of being. It is being held by the very word of Jesus. He is supreme. He is reigning and ruling. He is holding, as it says... He is holding all things together. For through him, God created everything in the heavenly heavenly realms and on earth. And look at this. For he made all things we can see and can't see, such as all plural thrones, kingdoms, rulers, authorities in the unseen world. Look at this. Catch this. Everything was created through him and for him. Consider that. Everything that he created was not just through him. It's for him, which means you're a created being and you were created through him and for him. You were created for him. He existed before anything else. He holds all creation together. Christ is also the head of the church. He's supreme over the church. I know right now, especially in this day and age of deconstruction and podcasts and YouTubes and opinions and this pastor fell and that pastor fell and this happened and that happened and people are losing faith in the church and I get it, I understand a lot of it, but you must understand no man is supreme over the church. No woman is supreme over the church. No board is supreme over the church. Jesus is supreme over his church. He is the head of his church. He is supreme over all who rise from the dead. He is supreme over death. Consider, the only thing death can offer was robbed. What what can death do? Give people death. Not anymore. 
death's identity was stolen. Because death is not supreme. Jesus is supreme. Even over death itself. We can keep, keep going. Do you know who Jesus is? Why? What is the whole poem? It's a song. It's a poem that the early church was saying. What's it all about? Describing and defining that Jesus is Lord. And he uses this word twice. One packet here for a moment. He says that he's supreme. Long before the brand ever existed, Jesus was. <laughs> he's supreme. What does that word supreme mean in the Greek? Here you go. This is what that word supreme means. It is to hold the highest rank, to be first, to be the greatest in importance and significance. I ask you a question. I've already shuffled enough feathers. Let's just keep going a little more. Is Jesus supreme to you? What do you mean by supreme? Does he hold the highest rank? Is he first? Is he the greatest of importance and significance too? Because this, this is what tends to happen. You know, let's, let's argue over words, if you will. This is what happens to most Christians. Well, he's super important to me. That's not his goal. I like Jesus. That's not his goal. He's, he holds an important role in my life. That's not his goal. You can write this down. Jesus does not want to be prominent. He wants to be preeminent. And those are not the same. Nor is this an English class. We need to unpack compound words. But he is not he should not be prominent to you. He should be preeminent. So I want to ask you today in these rooms and overflow rooms and there's the mom's room and family room and lobby, wherever you're at, is Jesus Lord yet? Is he supreme? Is he preeminent in your life? Not in the church, not in the cosmos, not in the creation not in death, not in all these things. Is he, cre is he Lord? Is he supreme over your life? Do you know why this matters? Do you remember in our early talks, some of the nerdy historical stuff? What is the three town? Colossae, Laodicea, and Hierapolis. They're right next to each other. And later we'll read next chapter or chapter two next week that Paul says, hey, Church of Colossae, make sure you pass this letter on to the Church of Laodicea and they pass it on. It's like these churches, they're, they're three in one. They had passed letters to each other. Do you remember the book of Revelation? Some of you are like, no, I forgot it a long time ago on purpose. <laughs> but Revelation one, two, and three, there's these seven letters. If you're raised in church, you might remember this. There's seven letters that Jesus writes to the seven churches. Did you know that one of the churches that Jesus writes a letter to is the church of Laodicea, a.k.a. the church of Colossae? Here's what he says to the church of Laodicea. Here's what he says to the church of Colossae. I write this letter to the angel of the church in Laodicea. This is the message from the one who is the amen, the faithful and the true witness, the beginning of God's new creation. I know all the things that you do, that you are neither hot nor cold. I wish that you were one or the other, but since you are like lukewarm water, neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. Those are not my words. Those are Jesus' words. And I want you to consider, he's saying, I would rather you hate me than kind of like me. That's what he's saying, hot or cold. I'd rather you be against me. I'd rather you be cold. I'd rather you not even want anything to do with me then be right in the middle and kind of hot and kind of not. He says, you are like lukewarm water to me and I will spit you out of my mouth. Who is he writing this letter to? The church of Laodicea. We are reading this book of Colossians to the church of Laodicea. Do you know what their problem was? You can read it in history. A bunch of other people from other religions that served Apollos and Hermas and, and all these other gods, these great, the pantheon of gods, started coming to church Claiming Jesus and convincing these believers that Jesus was just another. He's not Lord. He's not special. He's not Messiah. He's a good man. He was a good teacher. He was a good prophet. But he's just another good God that you can add to your list that you're serving. And the church of Colossae or the church of Laodicea started becoming lukewarm. And in our language, it sounds like I love my Friday nights and Sunday mornings too. 
I love my private DMs and my public of Scripture. And Jesus is like, I'd rather you hate me. I'd rather you be against me than be lukewarm. I've said this before, and I'll say it many times as long as I'm the pastor here, because I think it matters. The greatest threat to Christianity is not atheism, it's syncretism. What is syncretism? To just sink Jesus with the rest of your life. Just sink him in there. To sink the world in Jesus. To sink Jesus in Buddhist. To sink Jesus in Muhammad. To just like, it's all in there. I have a bunch of things I like. Serve, crystals, Jesus, church, church, Ouija boards, this thing, that, my, whatever. I just like, I have Jesus and a bunch of other stuff. The greatest threat to the gospel is not atheism. It's syncretism. <clears throat> Got real quiet. Um, also, side note, um, this little five verses that we read is a song that they sang. Be careful what you sing. Because you typically start to believe what you sing. I'm just throwing that out there. Be careful what you sing. Because you will start living what you sing. So number one, Paul wants this church to know in the first chapter, Jesus, you can't hide him. He will be evident. Number two, Jesus is Lord. Let's keep going. <clears throat> Are we okay? Yes. I don't believe you. <laughs> Verse 21. This includes you who are once far away from God. You are his enemies, separated by him, uh, from him by your evil thoughts and actions. Yet now he has reconciled, past tense, reconciled you to himself through the death of Christ in his physical body. As a result, he has brought you into his own presence. And you are holy and blameless as you stand before him without single fault. Verse 23, but you must continue to believe this truth and stand firmly. Don't drift away from the assurance you received when you first heard the good news. The good news has been preached all over the world, and I, Paul, have been appointed God's servant to proclaim it. The third thing I want you to see is Jesus is enough. <clears throat> I, I wish I had another 45 minutes to explain to you the cultural essence that's happening in these verses. Because uh, if you go to Acts chapter 8, we don't have time today, but if you go to Acts chapter 8, there's a witch, there's a, a sorcerer named Simon the Sorcerer who had power to heal and power to split water and um, unbelievable evil power, which if you need to go back and listen to our Spiritual Realm series, go do that. Simon the Sorcerer saw Peter heal someone in the name of Jesus in Acts chapter 8. Simon the sorcerer comes up to Peter and says, hey, that power, that name that you just used, I want it. Can I buy it from you? The name of Jesus will be a good addition to my resume. He'll give me more power. Hey, Peter, that name that you just prayed and I want it. Can I buy it from you? And then Peter rebukes him and it's this whole thing. But Simon leaves where, he at, where, where, where Peter is with him and he moves. And did you know that his, historians would say that Simon the sorcerer starts a spiritual movement called Gnosticism? I'm sure you've maybe heard of it, to be Gnostic, to be, believe in Gnosticism. If you don't know, Simon the Sorcerer starts this spiritual movement called Gnostics. And the ideology or the ideals theologically or spiritually of these people who call themselves Gnostics is this. They believe Jesus was the best option the universe had to send to the earth to give us enlightenment. And the whole point of Jesus is not salvation, it's enlightenment. And if we would focus on Jesus, he would enlighten our mind, bring us intelligence, and one day, hope to God, we get smart enough for God to reveal himself to us. This is what Paul is condemning. This is what Paul is going after. Now, it's very subtle, but you must pick it up. In verse 22, he says, yet yeah, now he's he has reconciled you, not your intellect. He's reconciled you to himself through the death of Christ in his body. As a result, look at this. He has brought you into his own presence. Pause, pause, pause. Your intellect did not bring you into his presence. He did. Your knowledge did not bring you into his presence. He did. 
And by the way, Gnostics are still very real. There's a lot of people in this room that probably have Gnostic ideals. Like, well, if I can just open my brain, if I can just be smarter, if I can just be more enlightened, if I can just have more things, if I can just know more, learn more, understand more. One day, if I can enlighten my brain to a certain level and get my intelligence to a certain plane and understand the world at a certain dynamic, then God might reveal himself to me. Friend, you are not Gnostic. If you're a follower of Jesus, we don't put knowledge above him. We don't put pursuit of intellect above him. Friend, your knowledge did not bring you into his presence. Jesus brought you into his presence. His goodness brought you into his presence. His grace brought you into his presence. His love brought you into his presence. There is no day where you can be smart enough to understand. There is no moment where you can be enlightened enough and open your brain and just be more fluid and more open to the spiritual beings and cosmos. And I'm just trying to let my spirit talk to me. What are we talking about? You think that's going to get you closer to God? You think rubbing that crystal one more time is going to get you there? You think you're one nap away from rest? You think you're one partner away from being happy? You think you're one paycheck away of being fulfilled? You think you're one account away of being happy? Friend, your knowledge is not supreme. Your intellect is not supreme. Do not be pulled in by the Gnostic religion and this idea from Simon the Sorcerer that if we can just be smarter, this esoteric, this, it's only for the smart ones, the enlightened ones, the special ones. No, you got brought into his presence because God wanted you. Do you actually believe Jesus is enough? Do you believe what he did on the cross is enough? Past tense, you have been rescued. You have been transferred. You did not reconcile yourself back to God. He reconciled you back to himself. Jesus, Paul was, I mean, you can't really pick it up because it's, it's, it's literature, not language. You can't hear his tone. But he's absolutely going after the idea that you earn this salvation by being smarter, more intelligent, more aware, more open. Jesus is enough. His sacrifice is enough. I want you to write this down. I think it's pretty good. Maybe worth taking a photo of and thinking about. <clears throat> you don't get salvation. You can put that quote up. Salvation is not mine because I'm enlightened. Salvation is mine because Jesus is mine. Salvation is not mine because I'm enlightened. Salvation is mine because Jesus is mine. And that is enough. Number four. We're almost done. Verse 24, we're going to end here. Once again, where's Paul? He's in prison. He's in a Roman prison in Ephesus. Look what it says in verse 24. I'm glad for when I suffer for you in my body. Come again? Wait, am I reading on the right? I am glad when I suffer for you in my body. For I am participating in the sufferings of Christ that continue for his body, the church. God has given me the responsibility of serving his church by proclaiming his entire message to you. This message was kept secret for centuries and generations ago, but now it has been revealed to God's people. For for God wanted them to know that the riches of glory of Christ are for you Gentiles too. And this is the secret. Christ lives in you. And this gives you assurance of sharing his glory. So I... So we tell others about Christ, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all the wisdom God has given us. We want to present them to God, perfect in relationship to Christ. That's why I struggle, that's why I work and struggle so hard, depending upon Christ's mighty power that works with me. The last thing I want you to see, number one, Jesus cannot be hidden. The evidence will be there. Number two, Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. Number three, Jesus is enough. You don't have to earn this. And number four, I want you to see this, Jesus is worth it. Jesus is worth it. This man is in prison, beaten, abused, 
ridiculed. He's not in a modern day prison with three meals and a shower. Like he's, he's in a Roman prison. Being beaten and persecuted for preaching Jesus. And he has the audacity to write, I'm glad I went through it. What? He says, I'm glad that I suffered for Jesus in my body. But I want you to catch a few things real quick about a theology of suffering. We don't have time today, but number one, notice he does not say, I'm glad in it. He says, I'm glad for it. It is stupid, I believe, when Christians are like, I'm so thankful it happened to me. I'm not, but I'm thankful for it. I'm not thankful in it. I'm thankful for it, for what it's producing in my life. Second, you must, we must separate this contextually and theologically. There's two different pains we can experience in life. Number one, we can experience the life of pain, just life touches us all pain. And then there's another suffering we can experience when we get persecuted for preaching Jesus. And those aren't the same. Paul's not thankful for the pain and persecution he's experiencing because life is unfair. He's in prison for preaching about Jesus. That's a different suffering. That's a different pain. I want to just say this to you. Whenever you lose something because of Jesus, remind yourself it was worth it. Man, I lost this dream job because of Jesus. Yeah, it was worth it. I lost, the, I lost these friends because I started serving Jesus, but he's worth it. I lost this aspect of my life because I started following Jesus, but he's worth it. This is what Paul's saying. I'm glad, I'm thankful that I got to suffer in my body for preaching Jesus. He was worth it. He says, I'm thankful that through the work and the struggle, God's producing something. The work of Jesus is in me, and I'm glad for it. Church, this is Colossians chapter 1. You must understand that Jesus is evident. You can't hide him. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is enough. And Jesus is worth it. Notice how the entire first chapter is about Jesus. Not about how to do church. Not about communion. Not about connect groups. Not about preaching. Not about prayer. Not about all the church things. It's simply about Jesus. Jesus. 